a very moving thing for me to be here because after all this socialist sister society is the lineal descendant, the lineal continuation of the old Communist Party historians group uh, which uh, I was engaged on from 1946 on. Uh, when I last heard from Dottie Thompson, who's now dead, at Christmas, she said the awful thing about getting old is that they don't want to hear what you want to say, they regard you merely as a historic source. So I hope you won't just regard me as a this, uh, historic record, part of the historic record, but listen to what I have to say. Um, for Marxists, interpreting the world and changing it can't be disentangled. The great majority of us, if we are Marxists, have become Marxists because we have felt ourselves to be politically engaged. And the same thing is true of anti-Marxists. It, it begins with a political decision, a decision about, at least in theory, political action. It's after that that you begin to discover Marx himself and what he wrote, and that this is of an extraordinary uh, interest, uh, not merely from the point of view of changing the world, but also interpreting it. The fortunes uh, of Marxism have depended very much on the situation in which people find themselves and when people think that the critique of capitalism becomes urgent, you see, uh, or that capitalism is somehow in trouble and therefore a critical theory of it becomes somehow or other more relevant and possibly a more immediate guide to action. This sort of thing happened over the past history for instance in Russia from the 1860s and 70s on, from the 1870s on, uh, in uh, Western Europe with the foundation of mass labor parties in the age from the 1880s on, very much so in my own youth in the 1930s and the 1940s and so on. Uh, conversely, of course, when it seems that Marxism is not actually directly relevant to the problems for which most of us became Marxist, then fewer people begin to be interested in it. And this was very much the case in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, nevertheless, at present, the world-changing part of Marxism has atrophied considerably compared to what's in the past. The working class, who are supposed to be the main agents of transformation, are declining rather than expanding. The traditional parties derived from Marxism, social democratic or communist, are in disarray uh, or they have disappeared for practical purposes. Under these circumstances, interpreting the world becomes actually a very much more important element in preparing to change it. And because only a critique of capitalism, only an analysis of uh, where we are going, where it is going, and what the potential agents of change may be, and under what circumstances they may act, only these things must be the basis of any revival of the political, the socialist project, or the equivalent of the socialist problem, whatever it may be called, in the 21st century. Practically all the discussions that most socialists have had over the 20th century do not derive directly from what Marx wrote, because Marx, for instance, wrote very little about socialism, except that the, he was hoping it would come into being in a certain way. He was passionately against laying out 
a program ahead which could be carried out. Uh, and um, consequently, he would be very much more, if you like, pragmatic in his approach to this thing, as indeed Engels was. Um, so, when it actually came to the point where socialism uh, or the socialist organization of production became, came onto the agenda in one form or another, most of the socialists, including the Marxists, had very little, nothing of practice to guide them. The only thing is, you know, Marx's critique of the pro Gotha program is very sensible, but it doesn't actually get you very far if you start, either you take have a revolution, or alternatively, it doesn't get you very far if you're in a situation like in Britain in 1918 and all over the Europe, where, for instance, nationalizing the coal mines for the first time becomes an, 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 a political issue. In those circumstances, Marxists couldn't really go back to the texts. They had to improvise, they had to figure out, you know, how to do it, often without any clear guidance. Now they had some guidance. They had the guidance, in some ways, for instance, of state enterprises, general enterprises, uh, in, uh, under capitalism. In many parts of the world, the railways, for instance, had been, were national rather than private companies. They had in Britain, and possibly elsewhere, certainly in Britain, uh, the precedent of municipal enterprise, municipal gas, municipal power, and so on. So in a sense, they could say, how, how have we been working our gas companies? But above all, I think, they had the experience of the uh, First World War, the war economy, which was very largely a controlled economy, an economy in which everybody had to discover ways of managing. There was also the case of some industries, for instance in the Soviet Union, in Russia, Lenin was unquestionably very heavily influenced by the experience of the electrical industry, because it so happened that a large number of leading electrical uh, executives, both in Russia and even in America, uh, were sympathizers with him. And so he was very well informed on, on things like, hence the phrase, uh, socialism plus electrification. But at, now, in these ways, therefore, now, if you want to go and criticize, you have to criticize the way in which people tackled this problem of improvising their new solutions. You can't go back and say, oh well, it was all Marx's fault or Engels' fault. Uh, that's the sort of example that I really mean in, in, in this instance. And in fact, a great deal of our 20th century problems, we can't either blame Marx for it, or indeed make Marx directly responsible or some other classic. Uh, I, one of the things that I think I thought was always very positive about Lenin is that when he tried to face situations which he thought Marxism hadn't faced before, uh, there wasn't anything, you know, he tried to do it not by trying to go back to the texts, but by actually looking at the situation. I'm thinking, for instance, of his little book on imperialism. You'd be surprised how little quotation there is in the book on imperialism uh, on, of uh, what Marx said and what Engels said. It's a question of, the important thing is that people had to think it out themselves. And if we want to criticize them, it is for the ways in which they failed to think it out themselves adequately. How would you respond to the suggestion that changing history in a conscious direction is actually an impossible project. Yes, I'm not sure that I know what changing in a conscious direction is supposed to mean. As in the Bolshevik? Yeah. I mean, Marx was not a voluntarist who believed 
that we have a program, we know what's going to happen, and we can carry it out by deliberate will and... Uh, in fact, what he had in mind was conscious human intervention, action, if you like, uh, which would bring about changes in society that, as it were, were on the historical agenda. At one time, as he said, man, humanity only poses itself to problems which are ready for solution. Well, he was a bit optimistic about that, but uh, that's another matter. Uh, now, of course, they couldn't be solved automatically by the process of history, by something like the forward march of labor, you know, or some other thing. They needed to be solved by action, and human action was absolutely essential to him. On the other hand, <coughs> one of the terrible consequences the terrible innovations brought about by the Russian October Revolution was that it came to power in a country in which everybody knew it wasn't ready for those changes. And in fact, they didn't expect to make it. They expected it, as Marx did, to spark off the revolution in countries which were more ready, particularly Germany. And it didn't happen. <coughs> And the terrible thing is that after that, they decided that the conditions for socialism in one country or whatever could be created by direct will and state action. Storming heaven. Well, storming heaven. storming heaven. And that is not what Marx would have thought, and that is not what they couldn't. Now that doesn't mean that conscious or even systematically planned action can't change the world, although its consequences may be quite un, un, unintended, will be unintended. <coughs> the most obvious way in which it does this is technical. <coughs> Whether the technique is civilian or military, Globalization was something that would happen anyway after Columbus and Vasco da Gama, but what actually turned it into a reality were a series of deliberate conscious actions, building railroads, uh, building a world network of cables for telegraph and then eventually telephone, and so on, the ancestors of the modern uh, communication and transport revolution, <coughs> which for practical purposes has abolished time and communication. <coughs> so give me, a, uh, if you go as old as I am, you become increasingly conscious that uh, old age is an obstacle race, and uh, <laughs> you get <could> put down. <coughs> now, I don't think political action has ever been that effective, although it has been quite powerful. But at least one form of political action, namely the revolution, has in fact been in the short term, extremely effective, and in the long term, its results have also been very powerful. <coughs> and this brings me to the point that we just heard about. What we're seeing at this moment is something which, for me, is uh, brings back my youth. The sheer experience of seeing <coughs> that the masses can be mobilized, <coughs> that a revolution. <coughs> Sorry about that. The re revolution. <coughs> <coughs> 
seconds. <laughs> seeing something like we saw in Europe in 1848 <coughs> and although 1848 was defeated the net effect in the long run was very powerful <coughs> Western European politics is not the same and not uh, couldn't have been but for the revolutions of the springtime of the peoples in Europe which we now see in other parts of the world and that's a tremendously encouraging fact. <clears throat> this is one issue in which in the long run uh, capitalism is incapable of solving. Uh, partly because it cannot be solved by economic growth, it is if anything created by economic growth. Partly because it cannot be solved by independent, independent entrepreneurial sort of um, anarchy of independent entrepreneurial actions and because it's got to be solved globally and it can only be solved publicly by public action. Uh, it has problems, it has political problems, but the fact is that the environmental problems is sufficiently grave for both states and, I hope, at some stage, uh, politically active citizens and, shall we say, the, the potential agents of social change to recognize that it must be solved if a catastrophe is to be avoided. Um, It's a paradoxical that Marx should, in some sense, uh, that the weakest part of capitalism should be exactly created by what Marx recognized as its great strength, namely the capacity to change things at breakneck speed all over the world. It's a nice dialectical turnaround. Well, the fact of Marxist economics not developing is certainly not due to suppression. Uh, it's perfectly true that in most parts of the world the academic establishment, once economics became a formal uh, subject, <coughs> uh, cut out or limited the number of dissident economists, uh, not only of Marxists. Uh, for instance, it's very clear that <coughs> uh, uh, this was very true when the LSE was first established by the, uh, the Webbs. Uh, at the same time, Economics as a subject developed in a very peculiar way, uh, roughly speaking, in the course of the so-called battle of methods at the end of the 19th century, the 1880s. Not only Marxism, but certain other brands of economic analysis, mostly the more broadly based, socially based ones, tended to be rather marginal. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the basic, uh, by, by, by the standards of, let's say, Marshall or uh, Pareto, very few Germans under the, in, 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 in the, the Williams Empire were economists in, in the technical sense. 
they had a school of their own which somehow or other didn't fit into the international system. The Austrians did have a school and uh, various other people did, but uh, and Marxism was part of the, so to speak, historically and socially minded things which was being marginalized by an increasing concentration, which has kept on being increasing, on mathematical techniques. Uh, for practical purposes, that technique, the, the, the economics as, 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 as a technique, has proved very useful, indeed it proved necessary. To some extent, it had to be, to some extent, uh, absorbed by or reabsorbed by planning societies and the failure to do so uh, didn't do them any good. But it wasn't really the kind of activity that Marx thought of. Marx did not think of economics as a tool for running enterprises or a tool for running uh, uh, <coughs> setting price levels, but in a much broader sense. Now where I think the development of Marxist economics was went wrong is that they failed at a certain stage to take notice of the actual change in the social economy. They kept going with it to some extent uh, up to 1914 for instance, with the theories of imperialism which were being developed. They kept going to some extent in the 1930s, but then it was easy because what was happening in, under capitalism fitted in very much with the Marxist theory of uh, <coughs> periodic crises. They stopped doing it for practical purposes after World War II. They certainly stopped doing it inside the Soviet Union because there wasn't, you know, officially you weren't supposed to say anything other than what was orthodox. But they also refused or stopped doing it effectively. It's very characteristic and I thought sad that the people who first started saying we are in a new phase of capitalism in the 50s and 60s were not the Marxists. They were dissident social democrats. You see people like Andrew Schoenfeld or liberals or like Galbraith and others. And we said, oh no, no, it's all still the same old capitalism. And we failed. That was, I think, one of the uh, major failures. Um, I don't know what the future is going to be. It's perfectly true, however, that you can turn the you can, you can turn the coin round and say that classical economics neglected some of the things that, from a purely technical economic point of view, Marx isn't very strong on, namely the theory of economic fluctuations and crises. And you can see over the past 30 years, where against any kind of realistic uh, observation of the world around you, official economic theory, which became practically universal, actually refused to believe that there could be such things as, as crises. The same had been true in the 1930s. It just didn't fit into that particular type of economic theory, or economic technology, if you like. And uh, that's why I think now, once again, uh, even the more technical side of Marxism can become of interest again to academics and should. Yeah, on the new fascism. We can't predict what's going to happen politically. And I think 
I don't think fascism is a good thing to use. Fascism is a fairly characteristic 20th century phenomenon, as indeed the Soviet type of communism is. But a reactionary, uh, demagogic type of regime is very much on the cards. Uh, I think the weakness of the present situation is precisely the weakness of the left as a mobilizer of political rebellion. That's why I'm so encouraged by what's been happening in Egypt, because the people that mobilized were not mobilizing from the sort of right-wing point of view. They were mobilizing in an old-fashioned Western uh, progressive mode. Uh, but we can't say so long as this thing is still not as strong as the rise of what is unfortunately in the 21st century the one universal global mass ideology, namely xenophobia, we can't be too optimistic. And I think that's what Rothschild may have meant. But finally, the US doesn't know what to do with its power. The US doesn't know what to do with its power because its power is, was designed to uh, defeat or hold at bay <coughs> another superpower. That other superpower doesn't, has disappeared. The things that challenge it, even from a military point of view, it is simply, un, it can't do. I mean, would you, uh, what can you do with uh, <coughs> nuclear arms against the sort of things that's been happening in Afghanistan, in Iraq and elsewhere? And lastly, the USA doesn't know what to do with its power because <coughs> it's declining as a state, as a world power. And the fact that it sits on more destructive potential via high tech doesn't actually help it very much. It would help it if it were still an all-powerful you know, it was still the big cheese in the world, but it isn't anymore. I think the Lung proletariat produces marvelous music. It's a major, <laughs> the major... The major creations of modern popular music occurred in Lung proletarian areas. If the people who do produce this music think that they're doing revolution, they may in some instances uh, tie up with it. This has been the case to some extent in Brazil, where a lot of the Brazilian music started in the 1960s essentially as a political student activity, but that wasn't looking for a Italian one. Uh, but mostly, if the people that produce great pop numbers and jazz numbers themselves to the opera. The net result is something like, uh, I don't know, uh, 19, 1968, which wasn't a revolution, but which was a lot of people pretending they were having revolutions. <laughs> The idea that, in fact, uh, the, the, the spirit in which people devoted themselves to the liberation of mankind and the liberation of, uh, through the liberation of the working class. The spirit which believed, if you like, a slightly utopian spirit which believed that there should be a society which wasn't just a better form of the present society, but a different society, and a properly human society, in which human beings could live as they, they ought to. But in the 
Marx's theory, if you like, what survives and remains is first, in my view, the materialist conception of history. I would say, of course, that's his trade, he would say so. But it's true. <laughs> the fact that the way in which the world developed, how the world developed, discovering how it developed through, from, shall we say, from the, 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 the cavemen to the present situation, is the essential basis of finding out how, if at all, we can solve this problem. And Marxist, the materialist conception of history, somewhat modified, is the best way of doing it still. Second, the critique of capitalism, not merely the critique that is constantly, you know, there are two things. First of all, the discovery that capitalism is not permanent that it will disappear. It's like Bernard Shaw once said, the great discovery Marx made was that we thought we were living in the, this kind of thing, but in fact, capitalism would turn out to be a giant cloud which moved along the sky and one day would disappear and something else would succeed. And this realization is an essential. But not only that, but the actual critique of the modus operandi of capitalism, the way in which it generates, it operates by developing periodic crises which in turn can either be overcome or are overcome but in a different way and create enormous tensions out of which, shall we say, within which politics exists. The Last point is that to, to hate injustice, to say to to, to, to to be furious, to be mad at seeing a world in which some people are poor and some people are filthy rich, and that something must be done about it. That isn't only a Marxist thing, it's not only a communist thing. But unless you've got that right deep in your throat, you wouldn't be likely to be taken interest in Marx or in any other uh, progressive uh, political activity. Yeah, thank you. Bye.